Welcome to another episode of the Impossible Life Podcast. I'm your co-host, Nick Surface, and I'm looking across at a man with leadership so strong, he can lead the horse to water and have the horse give him a drink. That's right, friends, the former <laughs> Navy SEAL. <laughs> Garrett Unklebach, a man who has yet to meet the beast he can't tame. That's and solid. That's not a reference to your dating life, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you started that one, I knew where you were going with it, and it was still funny, so it was a good one. Dude, this is probably the nicest thing. Can we end this podcast right here? It's probably the nicest thing you've ever said about one of my intros. I'll keep going and still be good, but you can end if you want. There you go, friends. <laughs> Getting a real insight into what happens here. Thanks. Well played, G. Yeah, I, uh, I was actually laughing out loud as I wrote that. And I often do when I'm writing these. I literally write these right before we go on. And uh, Garrett always just kind of shakes his head at how amused I am by my own jokes. But you know what, man? If you're not so, having hey, fun. Like I said, you know, I think Rian and I agreed your batting average is like, you know, Anyways, that's You're not bad, what this, it's not, 200 it's or not 300. It's not what like this that. podcast is about, Garrett. Let's just move on. Anyways. I think it is kind of what this podcast is about. You know what, though? What does that say about my resilience? That two of the people who are closest to me in life tell me that I'm only funny half the time and I still oh, press wait. on. That's generous. No, she said half, okay? And I, 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 I was insulted by that. <laughs> you, know, you know who likes my jokes? Your wife. So praise God that he gave me a little sister that thinks I'm funny. You know? I'll take it. Anyways, the reason we're talking about our wives is because today is uh, we're kicking off a series on marriage. Called the possible of marriage. We've talked about marriage plenty of times, but we haven't done a, a series on marriage. Yeah, so it's going to be great. I'm, I'm actually, I'm about as excited about this and series as I have been about any. Yeah, because how are we going to end the series? Well, gee, we're going to bring our wives on for the first it's time. time. It's time for you to meet our wives. I'm very much looking forward to that. My wife has a wonderful British accent, which everybody will get to enjoy. Your wife is like the beaming ray of sunshine. And I think people will see the yin and yang that or yin and yang that is your relationship. Uh, Because Lindsay is just, (laughs) and you're Mr. Rest and Intensity face over there. So that's how we're going to finish it. And you'll understand why. But the the point of doing this, this whole series is is we really want to paint a picture of what's possible because marriage is the literally the first institution that god set in place after he after he created the world and it is you know as pastor keith says when you get it god's way it's heaven on earth and when you don't it's hell on earth and so it's it's such a massive thing and i will say one of the big drivers behind this is I, i you know you think you know what a good marriage is and then you see a really good marriage and you're like oh i didn't know that's what's possible and unfortunately i think for most people what they have modeled for them is not a very good marriage. There are some people out there who are blessed to have parents that, that provide a great role model, but marriage gets a really bad rap in society. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that back that rap up with, with you know all their horror stories and with their actual marriage it's that people can see. It's been their experience. Yeah, it's been their experience. I, I liken it like this, Jeep marriage so i was driving back from broken bow recently where uh, we went for stay in some beautiful cabins a pretty bit. nice place yeah shout out broken bow retreat very very nice and so i was staying up there and it, we're just real quick you know since we got everybody uh broken bow retreat.com <laughs> if you've ever wanted to visit broken bow not planned but you brought it up so uh broken bow retreat is a beautiful place that my father and i designed and built and is still in construction but beautiful cabins uh 80 acres along the river over a mile Gorgeous. of river frontage yeah if you live in the DFW area or even Louisiana, Arkansas yeah, it's area, like two and a half hours, yeah, it's two and a half hours from Dallas. Go to brokenbowretreat.com. You can check out some of those beautiful uh, river front rentals. There's a lot of rentals in Broken Bow, but there are very few on the river. Yeah, and it's our little amazing retreat there is just uh, if you enjoy being on the water or just being outside, this is it's a lot different than plenty of the other cabins up there in Broken Bow. So if you've been to Broken Bow before and you want to try out the best place, go to brokenbowretreat.com. Or if you've never been and you want to just know the best, go to brokenbowretreat.com. Where is this guy? You know, <laughs> Mister Voiceover Rita. That was that was amazing. Anyways, but yeah, the point was we stayed there. I mean, honestly, nothing Garrett said is is biased. Uh, well, I guess I guess you, you, that'd be stupid to say it's, it's biased, biased, but it's, it's true. true. Yeah, it, it, we had a phenomenal time. Cabins, <laughs> unbelievable. Enjoyed the river. Like took my kids, you know, cold plunging every day in the river. Dog ran wild. We had a phenomenal it's time. A, it's a great time. And as we're driving, so we're driving back because you know you got a two and a half hour drive back, and you know I'm in the family ride, and it's got a pretty pretty good little uh, pickup. Uh, you know, you can step, you put your foot down, it goes. Well, this person's, you know, you're, you get on these lanes that are like 75 miles per hour, and I'm stuck behind somebody. Who's going like yeah. seventy six? There's a couple places on that right. Drive you can so get I'm, stuck. I'm waiting for the two lanes to come, and as soon as the two lanes come, I'm like giddy up. So I pull over. By the time I pass this person, this is not a joke. It was ninety four miles per hour. I had to go to get around this person. So while I'm behind them, they're seventy six and seventy seven the whole way. And, and I'll be honest, I it wasn't like they put their foot down to beat me out. They it's, it was just this subconscious thing of oh someone's trying to pass me and they yeah. just were and oh, we, we all see this all the time it happens all the time right but but the reason I'm sharing this that's most people's view of, that's how most people do things in life 
They don't really have a gauge of like what's fast or what's good in their life. And so they're just going to be a little bit faster than the person next to them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great if the person next to you is 100 mile per hour, like go for it, greatness type of person. But unfortunately, a lot of people are surrounded by people who don't really have much vision or purpose in life. And mediocrity is kind of the standard. So you're basically the person that's going, oh, well, they're going 30. So I'm going 35. I must be the fastest person in the world. It's like, you're not even freeway speed, man. You're not even ready for the highway. Yeah. And, and that's that's how most people's like marriages work as well. Is they like they will just be a little bit better, hopefully, than what they saw, or they end up repeating the same mistakes. They're a reflection of what's around them. Exactly right. Saying. That's exactly right. Thank you for summarizing that in one sentence. It wouldn't have been as interesting of a story <laughs> if you would have told it. <laughs> Anyways, so the question for you, if you're out there, is like whose marriage did you model or yeah. are you going to model? Because for most people, it's it's the one that they grew up seeing the most of, which was their own parents. And so now the, the logical question goes, do you want your parents' marriage? And, and I'm sure some people out there are saying, oh, heck no. Other people are like, hmm, I don't know. And other people might be like, yeah, my parents had a great marriage. But unfortunately, by and large, it's, it's, the, it's the former. You are like, no, I don't want anything like that. And, and here's what the fault is in marriage, right? You have two people that come together. And you're bringing all the meanings that you have from your life. When you're a kid, you develop your map of the world. And your map of the world is how things work. So let's say, for example, a great place where you see a lot of conflict in marriage. You're going to bring in what you what love means to you, right? So if you grew up in a family where, like, communication wasn't a very big thing, but, like, your mom or your dad would just do things for you because that's how they showed you loved you, without realizing it, you just kind of learned that, hey, when you love people, you just do things for them. You don't necessarily say something. Well, contrast that with your wife or your husband or whoever the other party is that may be coming in. And let's say they came from a very expressive. Love means you talk about things. The meaning that you have for love, you both are saying love, but the meaning of how you express it is very different. Well, now you come into a marriage and it's like, you never tell me you love me. What are you talking about? I took the dishes out. I, I mowed the lawn. I took the trash out. And now you're in conflict because you're not speaking the love language of your partner. Well, you do that in so many more things. The loved one is an obvious example. But what about what you bring your meanings for financial, financial success? What about your meanings for what it means to serve God, raise kids, you know, career-wise, what you should drive? Like, there's so many things. What does friendship mean? What does the actual you two working together? There's What does marriage mean? You bring in all these different ideas, and it can be an absolute colliding of two maps. It's like taking Europe and America and just smashing them together. There's going to be a lot of friction, a lot of explosions. You, you tried that as well. And things are going to break. What? <laughs> smashing Europe and America together? Yeah. Well, you, you know. Married a British woman. I did, but they don't consider themselves European, G. So thank you for offending our, our number three country. Australia is number two. Uh, but anyways, yeah. But no, you're, but that's that is what it's like. You're you're bringing it together. So we want to just we want to just people know that we see that all the time where people are conflicting. There's you know they have different communication styles, all sorts of things. But really, if we go back to the beginning, like God had a very clear intention. Like we said, it's the first thing that He put in place. Gee, so like, talk us through where this all starts. I will, I will go to God's design, but I do just have to take a step back for a second. Britain is a part of the European continent. When you study continents and geography, you know it's hey, you can feel that way about it. That's like you know, saying the United States isn't a part of North America. You can I, I get that, and you are you are one hundred percent technically right. But as a guy who lived there, as yeah. opposed to the guy who's who's like watched a movie on it, which is you, <laughs> this is like me telling you about like weapons. It has nothing to do with. I'm just this is geography. Yeah, dude, I know, but the point being, they don't. They call them the continent. It's, it's the continent. They don't consider okay. themselves European. They consider themselves British because you got to remember that's you know they, they don't consider pride. themselves European culturally. Right, exactly. And so they, anyways, let's move on. I don't think anyone's getting smarter <laughs> from listening. To, Garrett's got this. Uh, like, it's not very often you will engage in absolute just. I fun. couldn't let that one go. You could have, but you chose not to. Anyways, let's go to God's God's design for marriage. So, PSG. yeah, um, on God's design. Before I jump into this, I'll just say. We're talking about the design, the template for a marriage, and you've seen a lot of things work, mm -hmm. right? And what I would say, and what you're, if you want your marriage to get better, good on you, mm -hmm. right? Like, I want my marriage to consistently get better. I've learned what a great marriage looks like by looking at some great marriages. And just like with any other thing in life, you can look at it and say, well, what's the fruit of it if you want to qualify how good is it? And you, you don't just see it for a short amount of time. You see it over a long period of time. Um, the marriages that I learned from the most, my, my parents' marriage and Pastor Keith and Sheila's marriage, two families that I spend a, a lot of time around, my family and their family, those are marriages that I learned from. I saw the fruit of them. And so I'm going to talk about God's design. My parents tried to follow God's design. And so what I'm going to say in this is I'm, I'm not apologizing for offending anybody, but what I am going to say 
is my my marriage design template that I'm following, which is God's marriage design template. Some people might not like that, and that's okay. And I would ask you the Pastor Keith uh, question, the effectiveness question of how's that working for you? So just look at marriages that have been great. And, you know, I don't have to, I'm not going to sit here and brag on my marriage, but I will brag on my parents. My parents have an exceptional marriage. Uh, they've mentored a lot of people in their marriage and my parents produce my, myself and my sister. And so if you have any respect for me and you know, I can, Nick can speak for my sister unbiased mm-hmm. cause she's not his sister, uh, that my sister's pretty great as well. She is, she's phenomenal. And so my parents did a really good job in raising us, uh, in loving each other and helping my sister and I both have great marriages. And so I just say that to say leading into God's design for marriage. God's design for marriage starts with, right? You got to look at the Bible in Genesis, Adam and Eve. God says, Adam, it's not good that you're by yourself. Let me give you a helper, a helpmate, Hmm. right? And so there's a lot of purposes in that. And we'll just dig into a few of them. It wasn't like for one, God gave Adam a job to do. Yeah. Right. And so God doesn't want Adam to be alone uh, because Uh, When Adam's by himself and God's not there, he needs someone that he can grow with. Also, Adam has things to do that he could do better with someone helping him. And it wasn't just a qualification of, you know what, Adam, let me make a second Adam and we'll call him, you know, Steve and you guys can be bros and you could accomplish more together. Right. He gave him someone who would compliment him. Yeah. Meaning different. We can be a form of a partnership. Right. Where I'm responsible for these things. You're responsible for those things. Right. And we'll make each other better. I have a role. You have a role. Just like Nick and I have different roles in our business. We do the podcast together. But outside of that, there's things that he's responsible for. There's things that I'm responsible for. We work together really great. Even our natural skill sets are complementary. Right. Like Nick's temperament, complementary to mine. We, we make each other better. In the same way, a marriage is a man and a woman supposed to make each other better. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's um, the understanding I want, I want you to get from that is before um, in, in the Bible, God gives Adam work to do and then gives puts a woman with him. Yeah. Right. And so it's not just, hey, I want you to have, you know, a buddy. Right. Right. I want you to have a helpmate. And so the understanding of a marriage like this is a chief understanding of a marriage. And this is different than a lot of the design for the world. A lot of people have a marriage of like, hey, what? who's going to make me happy? Yeah. Who's going to give me what I want? Who will put up with my nonsense? Who is attractive to me? Right. Right. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't, that, you know, you want to be attracted to your spouse, all those things. That's not what I'm, I'm knocking on. What I am knocking on is that a lot of marriages, the marriage is about them. Right. It's about me. It's about you. It's about, you know, what do we want? What's going to make us happy? Whereas God has created each of us with a purpose. And I started my marriage with this thought process of God has a purpose for me and the purpose isn't me. Right. And I want someone who wants to join me in our collective purpose of number one, advancing the kingdom of God, but also join me in what God has put me on the earth to do. It's not all about me. It's about us serving God. Yeah. And so my, my wife, Lindsay, she's my best friend. She's my closest friend. She's the person that I enjoy spending the most time with. Um, she feels the same way about me, but our lives aren't just, yes, the Bible says when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. God is, she's one of the greatest gifts that God's given me, but God didn't just put us together for the purpose of us being together. He put her in my life, right? Put us together the same way God gave Adam to even said, you two can do more together yeah. than you can do by yourself. Yeah, because it's so interesting. Like you've pointed out before, it's the only time that God said it wasn't good. He's made all this very intentional design of like, I mean, you look at the order with which he created the earth. I just think it's fascinating, the order. He, I mean, he was setting up almost like a perfect incubator for man to be put into. He does all that, makes man, and like he's God, so he knows everything. Makes man, then goes, hmm. Yeah, actually, that's not good. And and one of the one of the many reasons is it leads to greater maturity for Adam and, and for Eve. They both help each other. So much of who I am today is because of my wife. Mm-hmm. She's made me better. She's helped me see some of the parts of me that are not great. Right? Yeah. She's. I've refined my leadership quality on my. I, I got. I, I roughed it out in the military, and I've refined it a lot in marriage. Mm-hmm. By if I can't, if I can lead her well, I can lead other people well. Right. If my wife doesn't love me, respect me, want to follow me, it means I'm not a good leader. Yeah. And so that's one of the other reasons that God put a marriage together is like, hey, you you two being together, this will help you grow. Mm-hmm. Um, but that works inside of a marriage, not, you know, being boyfriend, girlfriend, not living together. It works inside of a marriage. Um, what a marriage is, is it's a covenant, 
right? And there's there's some practical side of marriage too, right? Before I just jump into, right, some biblical, spiritual, just in, even for people who are ungodly, a marriage is legal protection yeah. for, a, for a family unit, right? Like in a, in a marriage, um, you, you, you can decide to get divorced and walk away, but there's consequences to that. If you're just living together, if you're just boyfriend, girlfriend, well, if one person gets sick or has a car accident, it's like, man, this ain't working for me. Right. You can just roll right out the door. That's not very deep of a relationship. Yep. A marriage is a covenant. And a covenant is this is uh, this is a more than just a relationship. It's a con it's a form of a contract where both people are saying, even if you don't do your part, I'm gonna do my, my part. Mm -hmm. God yeah. God started his relationship with men with a covenant of him saying, I'm going to do my part even if you don't do yours. It's more than a promise. It's a promissory form of a contract, mm -hmm. but it has a greater purpose. God's covenant with man was to show, like through this covenant, he's going to show his glory. He's going to reveal himself, right? Show yeah. his glory to humanity. So the purpose isn't just like, hey, here's the terms I'm going to hold you to. Right. It's a commitment of here's what I'm going to do to show you who God is. Right. And it's the same thing within a marriage, right? Like uh, Lindsay and I are together in this covenant where I'm saying, where she's saying, I'm going to do my part, even if you don't do yours, because my, my, me being my, who I'm supposed to be in this marriage isn't only because you make me feel a certain way. I'm going to be who I'm supposed to be in this marriage because this is what I've committed to before God. And through this marriage, it's going to be a way for me to glorify God. It's one of the greatest things God's given me to grow and mature through that I can learn how to love, that I can be loved, that I can have a partner. But in all of this, whether you're perfect or I'm perfect, it doesn't matter. We can glorify God in us doing this. And so what that does, it puts a marriage, a, a purpose upon the marriage that's more than just personal enjoyment. Yeah. Right. And, and there's work to do in each marriage yeah, for sure. Right. Like there's uh, the, the thing that God's given the, the, the type of work that God's given to uh, all of us is the great commission and the great commandment. But before I even get to that part for most people, God gives them a family. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's work to do. That's going to bring you closer together. That's going to mature you. And that requires uh, a man and a woman to do it right. Yeah, I, I think that's such a, that right there is such a physical picture of God's greater design, right? Because when Adam and Eve, when he looks and says it's not good for Adam to be alone, Adam has the seed of future generations in him, but without Eve, it's not it, he's not accomplishing the plans and purposes that God's made him for, right? Like God wanted them to what would you say? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and take dominion, yep. right? So how the do you, creation mandate? Right, that's his creation mandate. So God's made them with a very clear purpose, but they could never accomplish their purpose alone, and that's what you're saying, which is a, a massive shift in perspective for a lot of people when you view your marriage as part of the purpose of fulfilling the purpose that God has for your life and that you both need each other to do it that's very different that's purposeful living like hey my marriage isn't just because I felt like it at the time or it was cool in my 20s or you know I'm just here to make you happy and you're just here to make me happy it's like no we have very specific work that we could not do on our own and that's why God said it's not good because it wasn't it wasn't fit for purpose. And in the same way that we've talked about alignments before, yes, right. An, an alignment is a relationship form of relationship underneath a governing authority, mm -hmm. right? And the the level of connection you have to that governing authority is going to determine the length and the quality yes. of that relationship. And so, because in a marriage, this is a relationship that's submitted to God and God's plan for my life. Though God's not going to change, yeah, right. And God has a plan for my life and a purpose for my life that I want to continue to pursue for the rest of my life. So as long as those things stay true and those things aren't going to change, it puts the marriage in a place where we can continue to grow and be healthy together, going in the same direction together. Whereas other marriages are like, well, you know, we kind of we grew apart. We're yeah. not into the, you know, yeah. I wanted this, she wanted that. And it became about individuals yes. and it didn't be, and it was, it was no longer about a covenant. Right. Now the good news is if that's, if Garrett's just described what your marriage is like, it's not too late, right? That's the good news. And we are going to get into that as the series goes on, but I just want to give you a point of encouragement because I think a lot of times if you hear how, what God's design is and you feel like you're way far off, uh, thank God we don't have to be perfect, right? G? Cause like you said, he's faithful even when we're not. So just to recap really quick and what this series is about, like I want people to get the picture of, I don't think I have a perfect marriage, but I think God has given me the opportunity to experience how wonderful a marriage can be. Um, it's the greatest blessing that I have. If you have any respect for me or the things that I do, I can say this without a doubt. I could not do the things that I do oh, with, yeah. without my wife. She's made me better. She's uh, helped me grow. She's uh, She fills in so many gaps in my life. 
And so what I want you to get from this uh, episode is not just how great a marriage can be, and maybe your marriage isn't great. I want you to see that. I want you to believe that your marriage could be great. But I also want to start us on this foundation of what the covenant is. And uh, let me say, let me talk about the covenant in a different way. It's just understanding that your marriage has a purpose that's not about either one of you. Yeah. This is a good analogy for this in Scripture is, you know, in scripture, we have the two things. We have the great commandment and the great commission. Yeah. The great commandment is love God and love people. And Jesus says, if, uh, cause they ask him, what's the most important thing that we do, right? Love God. And the second to that equal to it is love your neighbor as yourself. And if you don't do these things, you screwed it all up. Mm-hmm. Okay. That we also have the great commission, which is the last thing Jesus said on the earth. And it's what he sent the disciples to go and do. And if we're followers of Christ, that's our work to do. Go and baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey Christ's every command, to become sti- become disciples, have a student-like mindset about what it means to follow Christ, right? Love God, love your neighbor, and go and do the Great Commission. This is the work for you to do. If you do one without the other, if you just love God, love your neighbor, and you don't go on the Great Commission, you've missed it, mm-hmm. right? If you just do the Great Commission and you skip the love God, love your neighbor yeah. part, You've really missed it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I say that to say these two things work together. One is not better than the other. They're both very important. You do both of them, right? And it's really, it's like, hey, the mission I'm on is to make disciples. And wherever I go, whatever I'm doing at all times, every single day and every moment, I'm going to love God and love my neighbor. Yeah. Right? And if I'm, if I'm, while I'm on the Great Commission, if I'm not following the Great Commandment, I'm screwing up. Yeah. You talked about his priorities versus what you do. Right. The the mission is the Great Commission. Right. right? A commission is to like, you, I'm going to send, I'm giving you this mission. That's what what we're supposed to do. That's what a commission is. I'm assigning a mission to you. That's what it means to commission. Right. And the commandment is, this is like a, a law. Don't break this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so see that in the same way as your marriage, right? Like the commandment is like within your marriage commandment is like, I'm going to love my wife, loving my wife. I'm going to do it. And we'll get into this. I'm going to love my wife the way it says to biblically. I'm going to lead my wife the way it says to biblically. But the mission is not about your wife. You and your wife are on a mission together Mm -hmm. to advance the kingdom. So it's both, yeah. right? If you just make it about advancing the kingdom, and this is just like my roommate who helps me accomplish stuff, not a great marriage. Right. If the marriage is just about us and how much we love each other, right. you're going to fall into emptiness and mm. the marriage will break. That's so good. Yeah, because I, I, you can think you can think of both of those. Because I, I think where people would... Both both things can be pe- things that people think are good. Like the the if you're all about what you do, this is if you don't have God, this is the power couple. Like, man, we're both on like five businesses and we're just killing it. Right, and it's like we've got all this money, and we're and doing everything this and becomes about the mission, and yeah. you don't, you forget the love God, love people part. You forget the depth of your marriage, part. right? Exactly. Or it could be the thing like, hey, us four no more. We love our family. Like we're just all about our family. And it's like that's that's really good. That is a really good thing, truly. But like you completely ignored the purpose of what you were put together for. And I think people would say, well, hey, what's wrong with that? Because if everybody just did that, if everybody just loved their family and had a really loving family. Surely that would alleviate all of life's problems. Yeah, that's a nice logical thought, but that's not how God set it up. He didn't make you just to be happy within your own four walls and, hey, that's it. You're, you just look after number one and number two, and then you're good. That's, that's just not the design. Mm-hmm. And so similar to what we just came off with the limitation series, you have to understand if you're building on something other than, than God's ways, you are setting yourself up for limitation, frustration, and failure. So just to simplify everything we've covered yes. so far, right, starting with what is God's way, God's way is a man and a woman come together for something that's greater than themselves to make a commitment to each other that no matter what we're going to be together Mm -hmm. and it's not, I'm not going to leave my wife because I found someone better. I'm not going to leave my wife because she made me mad. I'm not in it, whatever, you know, insert dumb reason for leaving your spouse, right? Because about you, we're going to stay together because God brought us together for something that's more important than either of us. Yeah. And this is one of the, like, this is one of the tenets of, not of the impossible life, this is one of the tenets of following Christ, right? When you first come to God, uh, it's easy to, like, get, what can God do for me? But as you grow and transform, you're real, you'll, you will realize, and Paul talks about this, right? I'm, I want to be a partaker in Christ's crucifixion so I can be a partaker in Christ's glory, Yeah. right? What, what ultimately following Christ calls you to is a level of sacrifice, which is uh, like no one's really excited about that. It's yeah. okay if you're not excited about that. 
you're you're getting there. You're gonna you will because you will grow to a place where you realize this is the greatest thing that you can do. Yeah. Right. This is the greatest service that you can have. And so if your marriage isn't there, just know that it can get there. And I'm trying to give this picture of what's possible. And if you know, if you don't feel like your marriage is great and you don't feel like you're at this place where it's, you know, sacrificial and it's not about either of us, it's about advancing the kingdom of God. Just know that that's possible for you, and we're going to talk through that over the next few episodes. Yeah, I love that when we were preparing for this, you talked about how covenant means that you're going to be faithful to uh, to even if the other person isn't. Right. And that that, I thought that was just such a very powerful way because people don't talk like that. It's very much like I'll be faithful. It's conditional. Yeah, it's conditional. And you talked about how it's unbreakable because it's like, well, here's what I'm going to do even if you don't. And that's powerful. That that's God, that's powerful. Right. We we are made in the image of God, and I'm not God, but God's love through me is going to help me be more like God. Yeah. And so I'm not I'm not capable of perfect love like Christ is an unconditional love, but I'm going to grow to to be that way as much as I can. Yeah. And so God sets the the picture of this in His covenant with us. Even if you screw it up, I'm going to do my part. Yeah. Right. Uh, where God was always perfect, and man like screws it up, and mm-hmm. you know is momentarily standing up straight as he's falling from right to left is really like man's version of getting it right. Um, In a marriage, it's more so like, you know, I'm going to get right even if you don't. And when I screw up, you're going to get it right. 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 Like, but we're going to stay committed to each other. And if we both screw up, we're not going to quit. Yeah. And I think it's such a picture of God's goodness because you talked about how he's got, he's designed it for a purpose and also for love, for that you would love each other and also fulfill the purpose. And I think that that's that's when you really see the goodness of God's nature. I I always think back to when you read in in the Garden of Eden, and he said that he made trees that were useful for fruit and also pleasing to the eye. And I just love that because he didn't have to make it pleasing to the eye. It could just yeah. be like, hey, there's fruit, fruit. It's all gray. It all tastes the same, but you know, you won't die. But instead, he made so many different varieties. He made different colors, and it's pleasing to the eye on top of the fact that it's actually really useful to eat. And that's the joy. Like, that's the nature of God that you see on display in fruit trees. That's what he desires in marriage, that it would be useful, that it would be purposeful, and also so full of love. And so the fact that we've seen that not, it, I, I think is like one of, if you're Satan and you're going like, how do I hurt this guy? Take some of his greatest designs, you know, and just destroy them. And so we talked about that, that the beauty of having the love and the mission. And of course, because uh, of your background. That's, well, I just want to say one more thing. Yeah. Like, that's really the, remember, advancing the kingdom of God. One of the ways that we do that is like revealing the glory of God. Yeah. And that's what a marriage can be yes. when it's two people who are, again, it's not about us. You're right. I was just reading about uh, some stats about the size of the universe. Hmm. And in the same way that there is a curvature of the earth, there's actually a curvature of the universe, meaning you can't see all of the earth from where you're standing. We can't see all hmm. of the universe from our current, interesting. from our observational point. And so hmm. they have estimated the size of the universe and it's way bigger than what we can see. And if you take, you know, all of the, um, all of the planets in a ga- stars and planets in a galaxy. Yeah. And you look at all of the galaxies that we can see and you estimate the size of the universe based upon what we can see and the bending of the universe within what we can see. Here's how many planets they think are in the entire universe. When you, when you look up at the stars, here's how many planets they think are in the entire universe. One billion planets for every grain of sand on the earth. Wow. One billion planets for every grain of sand on the earth. Just go stand on a beach somewhere and wow. look at all the sand that you can see. And every grain of sand reflects a billion planets somewhere in the universe. And then think about Jeez. all the beaches in the world and all the beaches on the planet. That is the number of planets in the entire hmm. universe that God has created. And I say that to say, when you just think about that, when you look up at the stars, you just begin to realize there is a glory yeah. that is beyond my comprehension. That's a perspective shift. And so when you, it's really, you know, you go from your small little life and you look up at the stars and you realize, man, there's so much more mm-hmm. than what I know. Feel that way about your marriage, yeah. right? It is very yeah. easy for your marriage to be angry and selfish and conceited and one-sided and prideful and just know that there is a level of glory that's possible for your marriage that is far beyond anything that you could ever imagine.
That's so good, G. Well, I want to get more specific into um, into your role models and to a little bit of what you brought to the table as far as when you were going into marriage. If you can harken back to all those eight years ago, I don't know if you can remember back that far, but you know, <laughs> I'm hoping you can. So I, I want you to share because you were you were fortunate to have, and I, I will say to what Garrett said about his family is 100 percent true. His sister is one of my favorite people. His sister's become my, even though she's younger than me, I call her like my older sister because she treats me like that. She's got that like <laughs> firstborn energy. I'm like, yo, I'm older than you. Anyways. Um, but she's phenomenal. I mean, if, for Garrett's parents, if you ever wanted to flex, you produced a Navy SEAL and a doctor. So, um, you know, you did all right. <laughs> if, if that's not enough credibility, uh, then I don't know what they need, what else you need. But I've, I've spent a lot of time with his parents. I'm very grateful that they've kind of adopted me and my wife into, into the family. And we get to learn a lot about how they do family and get to see consistency. One of my favorite things is when your dad comes around you because he hammers you the way you hammer me. And that is a true joy. But, but you had these great model, role models. And I want you to talk about what it was that you saw in them. And the reason I want you to share this is because for so many people that don't have that, you need to have models. We talk about this, how from a young age, you will imitate other people. And we talked about at the beginning of this, you could be like the person passing another car. When they try and pass you, you speed up. But if no one's trying to pass you, you just gradually slow down because you're only going to attain to what you, the level that you know. And so you need to identify good role yeah. models. Marriage doesn't have to be hard. Right. But it's really hard if no one's shown you what it looks like. For sure. I got the, like I learned, I saw this so many different times in the military where I learned how to skydive really fast because I learned how, I like my instructor has world record, like he had world records in skydiving. He was actually super cool. The guy who taught me to skydive was the guy who trained Patrick Swayze for Point Break. Oh, nice. And then was the ca his cameraman. So like did all of his jumping with him. Oh, you told me that. Yeah, that's right. so cool. This guy is movie. world class. Yeah. So you know what? Jumping was really easy for me to learn. Right? Yeah. When I learned to shoot, I didn't learn from other Navy right. SEALs. They brought in some of the best shooters in the world, not military people, just people who are perfect with a firearm in their hands. Right. And I learned from them, and I learned very mm. quickly. Yeah, And very so uh, just that's just a few examples. When you learn from people who've really been there, done that, um, I'm waiting for that to rub off in golf. I've played <laughs> with, like, multiple professional golfers. <laughs> for some reason, I'm not a professional yet. Wow. Um, Can't believe it. But I will say, every time I play with a professional golfer, I have gotten at least one tip that I have kept that works mm -hmm. really well for me. Like, I played, uh, played golf with Paul Stankowski one time. He's, he's on the senior tour now, but he's, he's a really great golfer. You can look him up. And, uh, like, he helped me in my chipping that I'm like, I don't even, I don't even need to practice anymore. Right? Like, for real? One tip from him. I'm like, I, I need to work on the rest of my game. Because, wow. uh, again, you just get around the people yeah. who have done it at a level that's beyond what you even thought was possible. And they're like little tip for you yeah. can be life changing. Yeah, for sure. So I say that to say marriage doesn't have to be hard, um, but it's really hard when you've come from a place where you didn't know what a good one looks like. Right. And so it's my hope with this podcast. And I'm not saying, hey, look how great my marriage is. I'm trying to share some of the great stuff. Yeah, you don't have to apologize that, 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 I've, I, that I've, I've learned. Anybody, I don't think anybody takes it like that. And so, um, and, and I say that to say, I don't feel like marriage was like super painful for me ever. Right. That's not a, that's not a compliment to me. That's a compliment to when you have followed great people. It right. makes it way easier. Uh, so just a couple things that I saw from my parents. My parents aren't perfect, uh, but I did see greatness in my parents. I saw my parents lean uh, really well on what their strengths were. Right, like my my dad, uh, strength I inherited from my dad is a lot of emotional equanimity. Yeah, my dad would not get upset. I I never heard my dad raise his voice at my mom one time, raise his voice at my sister multiple times, but <laughs> I never heard him raise his voice uh, at my mom. And my my dad was just always like really stable and consistent. He's consistent in who he was. He was consistent in his character, right? Like he was just I could trust in my dad, and because I could trust in my dad, I know my mom felt the same way about it. Yeah, right. Which it's just such an anchor, and especially for a father and a family that your your family knows what they're going to get out of you. Yeah, that they can expect you to behave a certain way. They can expect a certain amount of character out of you, because in a family, the the father, the 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 man, the husband. He's supposed to be the strongest and most powerful one in the family. And if this guy's just flying off the handle all the right. time, everyone else in the family is going to be scared and anxious all the time. Yeah. My dad did the opposite. C catch that. Your anger and your lack of control is actually a weakness. And you're handing that weakness down to your family because you're giving them uncertainty, anxiety, and, and they, they can't know how you're going to show up. I quit. I, if you know me personally, you, you know you've probably never seen me lose my cool. But for a lot of people who, who know me closely, 
might be surprised to know that as a kid, I lost my cool all the time. I was like a major hothead Mm. until like 11 or 12 years old, right? It took me that long to learn it. I say that to say it's not something that was natural to me. Um, I think it's it's typical for a lot of people yeah. to be, or especially for men, you know, you have, you see, I see it in your son, yeah. you, get, you get an ounce of testosterone and you turn into a hothead. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But because I had a great model show that to me, I was like, man, that doesn't like being a hothead doesn't work. Right. Right. And only I, I start to, once you start to get into that zone of awareness, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old, where you become self-conscious in the right way, you begin to right. look at yourself and yeah. see yourself. I was like, man, that doesn't work. Yeah. And my and when your father's showing you a model of what works really well. And so consistency of character, consistency of attitude, not losing is cool was a great example. My parents said, I always saw my parents, and again, I'm just pointing out some of the qualities that I saw my parents display that are individual attributes, but are also attributes of their marriage because they did these things together. Um, I saw my parents always serve God together, right? My um my my dad grew up with a uh my, my, my grandparents got saved when, when my dad was a young man, when he was in, when my dad was like 10 or 11, my grandparents got saved. And, um, I think maybe a few years younger than that. And one of his brothers, he has, my dad has two brothers. One of his brothers, you know, stayed in church with him. One of his brothers, you know, my grandparents would always take him to church and he'd walk right out the back door mm. and his life went in a terrible direction and he never really recovered from that. And my parent, like my dad got an anchor from my grandparents of like, Hey, we're going to be in church. Like this is the type of family that we're going to have. And before, um, we were ever, ever at elevate life church, my dad just said, Hey, look, we're always going to be in church. And up to the point of, there was one thing I always wanted to do, begged my dad to do. And he never, you know, took one step back on it was I always wanted to race motocross. And my dad told me the same thing over and over again, son, we'll never race motocross because motocross is on Sundays. Yeah. Right. We're just not going to do that. You can can play something else Uh, because my dad knew like our family is going to be in church. And so it's one thing, you know, you can say God's important, but when you travel every weekend and you're doing stuff, that's your family's out of the house of God, you're teaching your kids. Yeah. Right. And so, again, that's consistency that you've got to do what you say, not tell your kids how important, you know, serving God is, but you never go to church. You serve, you know, uh, once a year. Right. And you're just not really involved. And I also saw my parents consistently invest into other people's marriages. They were great marriage mentors of other people. Still are. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think it was around 11 or 12 years old that I remember it starting to happen where, you know, there's just these, when you're a kid, it's just like, who are these random adults at my parents' house yeah. on the couch? My parents are like, go outside or stay upstairs, you know, <laughs> right? Because we're talking with people and yeah. this is important. I've always seen my parents pour into other people. Another thing, I never heard my mom or my dad talk back, talk bad about each other. Mm. My dad never talked bad about my mom. So to, like my dad never yeah. was never bad mouthing my mom to me. And the same with my mom, right? My mom was never bad mouthing my dad to me. Uh, doesn't mean either of them were perfect. But what I saw in them, and again, this is like pro tip for Lindsay and I's marriage, right? Like we've always been so for each other. Mm-hmm. I've never talked bad about her to other people. She's never done the same for me. And it's one of the most like it hurts our hearts for people when we hear them talk bad about their spouse. Yeah, for sure. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, you, you start talking bad about anything. It's not just a reflection of what you believe, but you're sowing seeds of destruction into that thing. Yeah. Right. If, if I have an issue with anything, I want to come to Lindsay about it. Right. Right. Like that's the person that I want to deal with any struggle that I have in my life. She's the one that I trust the most. She's the one that's the most supportive of me. Right. And if you, you've got to build them up to be that other, otherwise, when you start talking negatively about them, you're going in the wrong direction. You're, you're confiding and putting your trust in other people instead yeah. of in your marriage. Yeah. And, and that's so common, isn't it? Just to like get separate and then start to complain. And it can become one of those things that you don't even question it. Cause you're just like, Oh, whatever. It's just how things go. And it's like, well, no, you're literally, I mean, a, you're not really making yourself look good, but you're not on, you're dishonoring your wife going out there and like spreading the the worst parts. And I mean, honor is believing the best whenever the worst is displayed. And we talked about it, it's a covenant relationship. So if that person's not doing something the way you want it at the time, well, hey, that's what you signed up for. And uh, another thing is just their level of communication. Uh, my my mom came from a family where like my mom's told this story many times. It's like really where she came from and her family that her parents wouldn't deal with conflict. And one time when she was like so upset, she just had to write a letter 
hmm. to her parents about like what was going on because they would just never talk about anything. That's crazy. So my mom came from a family where communication was not handled well. And getting married to my dad, my ma- like if you know my dad, he's just like a very direct, <laughs> he'll tell you how, it, he'll shoot you straight, he'll tell you how it is. Always. Like, we're going to have the conversation, right? Yeah. Like doesn't, you know, I know this is a hard thing to be said, but I'm going to say it. And so really the other end of the spectrum for my mom. And, I, you know, I remember, you know, as a young, when I was a little kid, they didn't always have it perfect, but I've watched them just continue to work through it, right? They like... They kept believing for, kept working towards, we're going to work this out. We're going to have the discussion, not we're just going to go pout in separate rooms and pretend it didn't happen, right? You've got to work through your mm-hmm. conflict. Yeah. Um, and that's uncomfortable, yeah, right? But just time. like in Mindset Mastery this month, we're talking about fear and pain. And like, it's painful sometimes to work through difficult conversations. There's been conversations Lindsay and I have had that's like, there's nothing fun about this conversation and I'm uh, dreading it. From b- before the conversation ever started, but I know we need to have the conversation, yep. right? And it's trusting your partner that, hey, like, I know this isn't going to be fun, but this is a workout that we got to do. Um, some workouts I like, some workouts I don't like at all, but I know I got to get through them. I got to get on the other side of this. Right. And so I watched my parents always communicate well with each other. And when you do that, when you do the workouts, you get stronger. Yeah. And so where I've watched the same thing, like... Uh, and this is a, a great example of having a good template to follow. I watched Lindsay and I go through some of the same things my parents went through, but we figured it out a lot faster mm-hmm. and got there a lot sooner, right? Where maybe um, it might take my parents, you know, days to work out some conflict um, before that, you know, before good, healthy, calm communication happens. And over time, they matured to a place where it's just great, healthy communication all the time. It took my parents till I was, you know, I think when I, I would say, and they might say differently, but I would say maybe around 10, 11, 12, I saw my parents really like master their level of communication. And I feel like it took Lindsay and I, you know, five or six years to get mm. to that place. Yeah. Right. It didn't have to take 12 years or 13 years. And again, that's because I saw a good example and a good template of how to do yeah. that. Yeah. No, that's so good. So just to, just to recap, we had Garrett share that because I want, like, if you're saying, hey, maybe my parents weren't role models or I'm not looking around and realizing you know, maybe I need a, a, a role model in marriage. What you want to be looking for? I mean, think about the things he said. He talked about how this is one of the biggest things for me, that they were for each other. That's one of the things that Rian said when we came in. She's like, I always want us to be for each other. I never want us to say bad, to, to talk badly about each other. And I, I was fully on board. So you talked about that. They were teammates. They communicated. With, even in the difficult things, they were supportive of each other. They served God. They were consistent. They were pouring into other people. I mean, that's a great... Well, one of the things that Pastor Keith says about marriage that I really love, he has he has some great marriage tips. He says, believe the best even when the worst is on display. Yeah. And I watched my parents do that. And there's a there's a private and a public level of that. Yeah, right? Like for how, sure. how you treat each other in private when the worst is on display. But then also, I think, I've, I've seen this, right? I've seen this in my friends. I've seen this in, in just in other marriages where when they're going through a hard time, you can see it, their level of unresolved conflict when they're around other couples because some yeah. the people in the relationship, they'll say things that are like a tiny jab yes. towards the other person. Yeah. Or their level of support for the other person in a conversation shows that it's like, well, we're not on the same team right mm-hmm. now because like we were having a discussion in the car and we're not on the same team. And until we get there, I'm not going to treat you like we're on the same team. Yeah. Right. Uh, your ability, your speed and ability to resolve conflict and the end, how you feel about each other in the midst of conflict really is a reflection of the health of your marriage. Very good. And so when you have a really healthy marriage, it's like, man, even if Lindsay and I were, were in a fight, we're frustrated, I would never say anything negatively about her uh, in front of other people or like dog her in front of other people. That's not a level of discipline, right? That's a level of purpose and care yes. about my relationship. Yeah, for sure. All right, so, so you get an idea of, of mentorship. You get an idea of what G's model was. And we want this to be just as useful for people who are married as for maybe some... I know we have listeners out there who are looking to get married. So let's look... Let's Like I said, let's see if we can go all the way back to you eight years ago, G. Eight years, <laughs> congratulations, you're officially above average in your marriage length, speaking as an old veteran myself. Um, <laughs> so, so what was your criteria for, for... Like you're coming out of the SEAL teams, and you talked about this before. You didn't date for five years. Yeah, so for five years, I was in the Navy. I didn't go on a date. I just... I knew... I couldn't do both those things at the same time Yeah, because some people did, but because of the marriage that like I saw people 
who had marriages. A lot, there's a lot of people in the SEAL teams that are married. And I met a couple people that's like they appeared to have a great marriage, but it, I didn't understand how it could work based upon what I had seen. So yes. I just said, you know what, I'll wait. Because even though I've seen it work for other people, I didn't really see or understand how. And so I just said, you know what, here's what I know works really well the way my parents did it, the level of relationship communication that they had. Um, I'm going to wait and do it that way. And so won't tell the whole story of me getting out of the Navy, but decided I'm going to get out of the Navy, uh, meet Lindsay. And there were some clear qualities that I was looking for. You know, some of this was from lessons learned in previous relationships I had had. Uh, a lot of this came from the marriage, the two big marriage models that I had, my parents and, and Pastor Keith and, and Sheila. There were a few things that I knew I was looking for in a, a spouse, like in a partner. Right. Well, like I said in the beginning, I know that God has a plan for my life and there's something that I'm called to do. So I need someone who feels that same way. Mm. Right. If you're looking for this marriage to just be about me and you or about you or about me, this isn't going to work very well. And so uh, one of my personal core values, one of our Uncle Bach family core values and what really the it's not our number one. Um, but the like I would say it it's almost like my number one because we had this convert. Uh, station when we were going through it. But anyways, attitude is such a huge um, core value for me. And that's the one I was the big no go criteria was negative attitude. Right. Um, and you guys hear me talk about that all the time. That wasn't just in a marriage. It's just anything in my life. If you have a negative attitude, I just really don't even want to be around you. Right. Uh, it's like you smell bad. Right. right? Like this is just never going to be fun. Um, <laughs> I was looking for a girl who had such a positive attitude. And that's Lindsay. She has a positive attitude. Like 99% of the time, nobody's perfect almost always has a smile on her face. It's just like full of joy, right? It's a choice to be that way. Yeah. I've seen her have a bad attitude one time and it was actually just funny (laughs) because it's so rare. It was just, we all laughed about it. Yeah. Um, So having a positive attitude, her, uh, I was looking for someone who was willing to follow me. Yeah. Right. I don't want to be, I don't want to be fighting a woman like, hey, you need to listen to me. Right. Right. I want to be, I want you to be, I'm going to be trustworthy. I want you to be willing to follow. Right. Um, Because I think that's important in a marriage. Again, hey, you can disagree with that, but I believe men are supposed to uh, lead marriages. If you don't believe that, you might need to reread scripture or find other people uh, that you think are a better template, honestly, because I believe men are supposed to lead the marriage. And I think so much of what's wrong in America is a lack of male leadership. Yeah. Uh, So I was looking for a woman, not... And I, I think submissive is a great quality, but I was, but I didn't say submissive on purpose because I think it's more than that. Is learning to follow it like is a leadership quality, mm-hmm. right? If you don't like, you can just be passive and give up, and I'll do whatever you want. That's not following, right? Following is saying I'm gonna choose. Like it's not following is not. It's similar to a covenant. It's not a covenant, but choosing to follow someone is making a commitment. Right. Right. Like you don't join a sports team and then quit when they put you on the bench. Right. Right. You don't join a sports team and then quit when they don't throw you the pass. Yeah. You're saying, you know what? I'm committed to this team. I'm committed to this coach. I'm going to stick it out. And it's learning how to play your role. Leadership is a role. Following is a role. And we go. have to work together and serve each other. R- r- really catch that if out there listening, because Garrett talked about if you have a problem with him talking about it, he wanted to find someone who would follow him. Go read Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, where Paul lays out about how the man's the head of the relationship, just as Christ is the head of the church. And understand that it's a matter of function. Like he said, leadership is a function, just like follow is a function. When you're in God's order, remember what he said. He made a man. It wasn't good for him to be alone. He needed a helper. Why? So that they could work together and bring about the plans that God had in the earth, which was the way that they glorified him. You need to have leadership in that, and it's a matter of order. It's not a matter of superiority. Just we, and, real clear and we, on that. And we went deep on that Ephesians 5 yes. in the leadership series. Right. And I also went deep in that with uh, Ethan Jago in our biblical masculinity. We talked about that right. there as well. If you want to go back to that. I'm sure we'll, we'll retouch it at some point as well. Um, so, But with Lindsay, it was... I want someone who will positive attitude, someone who will follow, someone who's committed to grow. Yeah. Um, One of the things I said early on, Lindsay and I like clicked right away, knew we were supposed to be together. I think I knew before her, but she knew pretty quickly. She like her when she tells the story and, and she, maybe she'll tell it when she comes on. She's like, well, I didn't know as much as you, but I trusted you is kind of the way that she says it. Yeah. Um, She said when you made her do the 15th pull up, she knew you were the one. (laughs) (laughs) Um, we did do a Spartan race together I on like our second or third date. I've seen the uh, pictures. Uh, but but anyways, um, 
follow positive attitude and her willingness to grow. One of the things I said to her early on, you know, we're a few weeks into dating and we're very serious at this point. And I said, there's one thing that'll make this not work. I said, for the, for the rest of my life, I'm going to grow. And if you are not willing to grow as well as a person, uh, this would be a very painful marriage for both of us. Yeah. Right. And I said that the way I say a lot of things, uh, the way I've, you know, said stuff to you, like I just looked her right in the eye and was like, this is, I'm, I'm hundred percent serious with this. If you don't want to grow, this won't work. And she's, you know, she's like, no, I want to grow. I want to be my best. Great. Cause you know, I want to be my, I'm not saying I am the best. I'm saying I want to be my yeah. best. I don't think you're the best. I think you're great. But if you want to be your best, we can be the best together. Mm -hmm. It's a commitment to grow. Cause if you don't want that, it just makes things really hard. Uh, submitted to God. Lindsay was new in her relationship with God. Um, and so there's, you know, there's different, uh, approaches to that. Um, I'm not saying that you should just go into ministry dating. I wouldn't say that Lindsay and I <laughs> were ministry dating. Lindsay was fresh in her relationship with God and I was okay with that. Yeah. Um, I wasn't right. And so if, if just because she was, doesn't mean that we couldn't go in that direction. You're together. saying you weren't new in your relationship with right. God just for clarity's sake. Yeah. So Garrett's a mature believer and Lindsay's new. And then, uh, from a purpose perspective, right. I needed her to understand that like our purpose in life is not about us having fun and having enjoyment. Right. And I was very, you know, strong in that from coming fresh out of the military. Like there's a, you know, I have a calling on my life. There's things mm -hmm. that I'm supposed to do. And as I was still figuring some of that out, as I was leaving the military, I couldn't even tell her what it was, but I knew that I yeah. had one. Yeah. I couldn't say, here's my purpose beyond like, I want to live for God. Uh, I couldn't tell her what the purpose was, but there is one and it's not about me. Yeah, very good. And we've talked about that a lot in purpose as well. So you've, you've experienced it. All right. So gee, we, the, the, we're coming to an end here and I, but I want you to leave people with something. So I'm going to just ask you something here. The whole point of this, like we said, guys, we really want you to understand just how great marriage is by God's design. Like it is meant to be so much more than perhaps you've seen or experienced. I hope that everybody out there listening goes like, yeah, that's my marriage. But we want to really just set, hey, this is what's possible for marriage. And to, for people to hopefully open up and expand their vision and understand God's design and that it has a purpose. It's also full of love. And like so much of him, it, re it reveals his nature, which is good. And, and that's how you glorify him is in your marriage. So G, to, to that point, like what, if I said to you, like, hey, what's possible for marriage? Because you've talked a lot about, about God's design, but I know you're a guy who's very visionary and you see things not just as they are. Like, what would you say is possible? Yeah, marriage does not have to be a burden. Marriage does not have to be something that's energy draining or frustrating to you. Marriage does not have to be something that you feel like is holding you back. Uh, Lindsay's actually said, like, and we've had, you know, we have dinner with, you know, new couples or people getting married, newly married. She tells people, I don't want to hold Garrett back. Like I want to help him, right? Like nothing makes me feel greater than when she says that, that she feels that way about me. Here's what a marriage can be, right? Like I, I feel, I've said this to Lindsay. I feel like if, if I didn't have anything else in my life, but I had you, I would feel incredibly blessed. That's what a marriage can be. I've told Lindsay that she's the best thing that God has ever given me. And I've, God's given me a lot of great things, right? That's what I think a marriage can be. For anybody that's listening to this, I just, whether you're married and it's not great or you want to be married, what I want you to know is that the same way that I told the story or, or the facts earlier of the size of the universe and how really great God's glory is, that's what's possible for a marriage. God, like God has given you something, this first gift that he gave to Adam. Hey, you know what? It's not good that you're by yourself. I have something to give you and you're going to love it. You guys are going to be together. A marriage is the most wonderful thing that you can have in life when you get it right. It's also one of the hardest things. But again, I wouldn't be who I am without my marriage, without Lindsay in my life. She's such a gift from God. And so what I'm saying to every single person out there that you're either married and it's not great or you're married and it is great. You're not married yet. God has a great plan for you. And when you decide, hey, it's not about me. I'm going to enroll in this journey. I'm going to go on this process with someone that feels the same way, that we can be better together. It's the greatest blessing. It's one of the greatest privileges that you can have in life. Someone you can always trust, someone you can always count on. You are meant to be with someone who wants you, who wants you to be your best. And I'll just say this. I've I've asked people this question on leadership. You know, if you were going to design a leader for your life, you could just write it out on scratch paper. Wouldn't you want someone 
who really wants the best for you, who would even make sacrifices and give up things in their own life for you. That's what a marriage can be. So if you, you could, if you could have a great marriage, you could have someone in your life that wants more for you than you even want for yourself. 